Good morning. This will be our Sunday School study for um, June 7th. We're already in June. How about that? Um, we're going to Revelation 10 today. First three verses there read, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire, and he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth, and cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. Uh, the writer of the quarterly uh, material pointed out that the description of this angel is similar to the description given of Christ in chapter 1 of Revelation. Um, since he clearly is not Christ, this angel is clearly not Christ, why is his appearance similar? Well, the answer is found in, in what certain things symbolize. We're told, for one thing, the angel is clothed with a cloud. Of Christ, we are told in Revelation 1.7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so. Amen. To the first century Jewish person, cloud imagery spoke of judgment, and specifically of heavenly judgment. In Psalm 18.11, we read of the Lord, He made darkness his secret place, his pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the sky. David's song in 2 Samuel 22 is nearly identical to much of what we find in Psalm 18. Now in Psalm 97 too, we read, Clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. So the association of clouds with, with judgment helps us to understand something we find also in Matthew 26. There, the Sanhedrin was out to find Jesus guilty of something. They were wrongly sitting in judgment on him. And we read, starting in verse 63, But Jesus held his peace. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God, that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, and coming in the clouds of heaven. While Jesus was being tried and judged unjustly by these men, um, basically what he told them was that he would one day bring righteous judgment. What upset the high priest so much was Christ's simple statement, in using the, the imagery uh, of clouds and sitting at the right hand, uh, he, 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 Christ used this, this imagery that spoke of him having heavenly authority to bring judgment, when obviously the Sanhedrin had no authority to judge him. So now, with these things in mind, getting back to Revelation 10, we can understand that this mighty angel is coming to announce more heavenly judgment. His feet are said to be like pillars of fire, and fire is also used to speak of judgment and of purging or purifying. So it's clear that what this angel announces has the authority of heaven. The fact that this angel stands with one foot on the ground and the other in the sea is sometimes understood to imply that this message is for all the world, not just one country or one continent. So, the angel stood like this and cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth, and when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. Whatever the angel said, it caused seven thunders to utter their voices. And this brings to mind an interesting point. It's common when people talk about Revelation to mention the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven vials. But here we have a fourth group of sevens, the seven thunders. 
Grouping things in sevens may well be indicative of their perfection or the completeness of their nature. To the, to the Jewish thinker of the time, seven was always associated with the days of creation, the time in which the creation was completed and in which the Lord rested on the seventh day. So the message of the seven thunders can be understood to be complete, to be perfect in what it declared. And what is declared? Well, reading on in verse 4, And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. So we don't know what they said. John was not allowed to share that message. We can know from uh, the appearance of the angel that these were further words of judgment, but exactly what they communicated we are not allowed to know. Now, um, in writing to the Corinthians, Paul makes mention of an experience he has, though he's speaking of himself in the third person, uh, in 2 Corinthians 12, he, he says how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for man, for a man to utter. Now the Greek there can also be translated to say, I heard inexpressible words, which no man is allowed to utter. So Paul was not allowed to share these things, nor could he have found the words with which to do so. Uh, so John, on the other hand, he understood what the thunder said. He was getting ready to write those things down when he was stopped. Why was John not allowed to write these things? Uh, he was allowed to hear them, but not allowed to share them with his readers. This isn't explained, but it should be enough for us that a voice from heaven told him not to write these things. Uh, many years ago, I, I read uh, something by Francis Schaeffer in which he said, God has not given us exhaustive truth, but he has given us true truth. In other words, we don't know everything God knows, nor could we handle it. But we know all that we need to know. In fact, uh, there really is no way we could comprehend all that God knows. Perhaps one of the best things we can get from John's restriction here is that we don't need to perfectly understand everything. And if you're like me, sometimes that gets a little trying, but the fact is here, John was told don't write it because we're not supposed to know it, and that has to be enough. Um, to use the Apostle Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. So while we can be pretty sure that the voices uh, of the thunders revealed more of God's judgment, for some reason that God knows, we don't need to know those details. And we should be okay with that, because after all, God knows the details. Uh, now let's move on to verses 5 through 7. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven, and the things that there, therein are, and the earth, and the things that therein are, and the sea, and the things which are therein, and there that there should be time no longer, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. Now, first in looking at this, let's consider the phrase, there should be time no longer. This is often taken as a declaration of the end of time. Now, time will indeed come to an end, but that is not what's being expressed here. The Greek behind this carries the idea that there will be no more delay. And in fact, that's how the great majority of English translations put it. 
The idea is that what is going to happen must happen without delay. And we're told, uh, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he declared to his servants the prophets. The Greek word mysterion uh, gives us the word mystery, but the word was used quite differently from how we commonly use the word mystery today. A mystery was something that had been hidden in the past, but was now revealed. Uh, so the point here is that what God had revealed through his prophets was now going to transpire and there would be no delay. Looking back at what we were shown just before chapter 10, we find destruction had come upon the earth in many ways. Uh, there had been uh, the death of one-third of all sea life, the destruction of one-third of all ships at sea, the poisoning of one-third of fresh water sources. Uh, and, and then there was, you know, the, the slaughter of one-third of those who remained. Uh, we read in Revelation 9, 20, and 21, and the rest of the men, which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. It is right after this it's it, it, that the angel says, there will be no delay in God's prophecies coming to pass. So, let's, let's look then at Revelation 10, 11, uh, I'm sorry, verses 8 through 11. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, and said, Go, and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel, and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it, and eat it up. And it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand, and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. It's interesting, John wasn't allowed to read the book that the angel had. Instead, he was told to eat it. Since John is told he must prophesy some more, uh, it's quite possible that the little book had to do with those things John would have to say. It was God's message. And as such, it was sweet, it was pleasant, but it would be a message of bitterness for all those who reject Christ. And though we take the word of God seriously and we rejoice in the promises that we have from God's word, if you think about all the people who are choosing eternal condemnation by rejecting Christ, there's a bitterness to it. There's a heartbreak to it. Um, to us, God's word is always sweet. But it is indeed an unpleasant thing to declare the word of God to people and to have them totally reject it. But still, as long as we're here, there must be someone who is willing to listen. In fact, my, my thought, and this is just, just my thought, is that the rapture will not occur until God knows that no one else is going to listen until something such as the rapture does happen. We know there will be some saved afterwards, but I believe the rapture will happen, and the, again, this is my opinion, when no one else is going to listen to our witness. But if we're still here, there still must, must be people who are willing to hear and receive the gospel. So while we're here, let me encourage you to live for the Lord 
and to be ready to share the truth with anyone and, and everyone so that they might have a chance to trust in Christ and therefore to be removed from this world before God's wrath is poured out upon it. We know God's word is true and it's there, there are sweet things in store for all those who trust in Christ, but there is bitterness in knowing so many will reject his word. Share it, pray for those you know, that they may be part of that great catching up, that they may be part of that great assembly of people who will be with the Lord in the new creation. Thank you for tuning in this morning. God bless you. Have a great day.